any New Testament evidence for liturgical or orthodox style uh, worship gatherings. We have to be very clear about what we mean um, by liturgy, because if we don't know what we mean by liturgy, then we don't know actually how to identify uh, and, uh, a liturgical type of worship at all. Uh, Paul refers in 1 Corinthians 11 to the uh, 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 rules concerning wearing a head covering or not. And he, when he does so, he does so in the immediate context of speaking about the celebration of the Eucharist, which is the communication of the body and blood of Christ. And he does so in the context of couching the Eucharist with the language of the inspection of jealousy, which is found in Numbers chapter 5. Now, as we talked about earlier, what the inspection of jealousy is, is it is a parable, an enacted parable, like when Jesus curses the fig tree. This is a parable, but it's not a parable which is told. It's a parable which is acted out. So, you know, in the, in the Hellenistic world, you would attach a theater to the temple. And the reason for that is because a theater is a sacred site. What goes on in temples is certain stories are enacted in such a way that the message of the story is actually pushed into the world. So you take uh, the whole system of Israel. Well, what's going on is you have people who are dressing up to fulfill certain parts and thus do certain things in terms of the life of the Israelite nation. So what goes on in a theater is a sacred act. We actually read that uh, uh, the tablets of the, or it's the golden calf is ground up. Uh, and those who participated in this are made to drink water mixed with the dust created by the destroyed golden calf. Well, in Numbers 5, the bride uh, who is being tested for infidelity drinks of dust mixed with water uh, and the dust is from the tabernacle that is it bears the presence of god because the tabernacle is the dwelling place of god it shouldn't be hard to see the connections with the eucharist now the point here is that paul describes the liturgical or describes since i'm answering a question about whether it is liturgical he describes the worship service of the church in terms of a regular order which is governed by what he himself calls tradition tradition whose authority turns on his having received it from those who have come before tradition which binds together the body of faithful in one god one lord and one spirit who distributes a variety of gifts in the one body uh, and he describes it using language that not only is taken from the Old Testament, but is taken specifically from the Old Testament narration of its sacrificial liturgy and its sacrificial worship. All of Israel's liturgical system in one way or another is predicated on her existence as the bride of God. You take what's often translated as an offering by fire, and this is a word which is used to denote or connote, I don't know, whether denote or connote is appropriate, it is used to uh, echo or signify the bridal relationship that Israel has with God, specifically in the sacrificial food, which binds them together. In the sacrificial system, what we have is the household of God. Remember the temple and the tabernacle. This is the house of God, but it is also the house of Israel. That's when it's that's why when King Solomon writes his Song of Songs, he describes the bride who is the subject of the song in the language taken from the temple. The temple was the palace of God, and the palace of God, or the palace in general, is simply the household of the principal family in the nation, because the nation is a family made up of families, and it's stitched together by a royal family. But ultimately, the royal family is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because it is in God that the creation as a whole exists. The uh, bride is described in the terms taken from the architecture of the temple because the symbolism of the Song of Songs is that of God's union with his people in the context of the transformation of Israel that's taking place in the period of the kings. So the period of the kings is associated with a corresponding liturgical transfiguration of the nation. David has the tabernacle of David. There's a whole set of new kind of uh, liturgical habits that come along with that. Uh, King Solomon builds the temple, of course. You have the book of Psalms. So now the sacrificial worship is joined to music for the first time in Israel's history, at least uh, in that history, as it is explicitly denoted or presented to us uh, in the scriptures. Uh, and that marital context, uh, that household context, is key for the Numbers 5 and for the New Testament. Because take the book of Acts 
as an example. A book of Acts begins with the apostles. They are gathered together in Jerusalem, and there's a specific house which they are gathered in. Now, in this house, there are about 120 people gathered together. Now, what that tells you is that the apostles, and there are 12 of them, they are, there are 11 at the beginning of the book, but they actually have to make up for the loss of Judas so that there might be 12 because it represents the 12 tribes of Israel because the church is an extension of Israel. Uh, and in that household, there are 120 about. Then there is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, why is Mary noted? here in the text. Undoubtedly, she was present at a number of events where her presence is otherwise not noted. Why are we told that she's there in uh, Acts chapter 1? What's the importance of that? Uh, well, we can understand its importance when we read Luke and Acts in parallel with one another. Uh, Luke also begins with the Holy Spirit descending upon the family of Jesus so that there is an extension of God's presence the world. The Holy Spirit descends upon the Virgin Mary and facilitates the incarnation so that the son of David, the son of the Most High, might come into the world and realize the promised kingdom. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit likewise descends upon the family of Jesus, except the family of Jesus has now been extended out so that we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, representing the whole and being present at both the miniature and the uh, the microcosm and the macrocosm, the head and the body. Uh, but now we have the 12 representing 12 tribes and then the 120 and the 120 representing an extension of the 12 tribes. It is a multinational uh, or it is a uh, extension of this family. So they're all together in one household. Household is associated with the family and household is of course associated with the temple. Now, according to tradition, it's not actually told us in scripture, but according to tradition, and it makes good theological sense, the descent of the Holy Spirit takes place in the upper room. The upper room is where Jesus celebrates the Eucharist, and you'll note that it is the upper room. The upper room it is the place above. Um, that might sound kind of pedantic, but it's actually not, because if you have... Uh, heard me talk about the temple before, one of the most fundamental principles I've argued for is that to move inward in the symbolism of the tabernacle and the temple is to move upward. I mentioned the Eucharist because we've just talked about it in 1 Corinthians 11, but also because the fact that it happens in the upper room when inward is upward according to the pattern of worship in the tabernacle is especially significant because the Eucharist is instituted after Jesus ascends into Jerusalem on the donkey. He fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. Behold, your king is coming to you on a colt, the form of a donkey. Uh, but that prophecy is a specification of an earlier prophecy in Zechariah. I will come and dwell in your midst. And that's the God of Israel who is speaking about his, uh, about his people. And he says, many nations will join themselves to you in that day. Now, he said, prefaces this by saying, sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. And that same phrase essentially is used in Zechariah 9, sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. But this time it's not God who says, I will come and dwell in your midst. It is rather, he says, the king will come and, uh, and be with you. Implication is the king and God, they are both described as coming. They're described as coming in the same terms and at the same time because God clothes himself in the flesh of the human family and specifically of the bloodline of King David. Uh, so the ascent into Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophetic word of Zechariah 9, is the fulfillment of the prophetic word of Zechariah 2, where God comes and he dwells in glory in the city of God to be a wall of fire around her and glory in it, in its midst. So Zechariah chapter uh, 2 says, uh, God makes himself present in the world, in the person of Jesus Christ. And when he enters into the city of God, he does so in such a way that it echoes the cadence of 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel 6, David takes the Ark of the Covenant, which had been in exile. This is the footstool of God's throne. It is the highest place in cosmic geography. It is the place where God is closest to touching down in the stuff of this world. He takes the Ark of the Covenant and he takes it on an ascent up to Mount Zion. Now, this is the only sanctuary in the Hebrew Bible, which is on Mount Zion. The temple is on Mount Moriah, but this is on Mount Zion. The prophets will again and again and again refer to the Messianic age as associated with Mount Zion. That is because the, mess the Messiah is the son of David. He is the heir to David's throne and David's life anticipates what he will do. And it is David's sanctuary that is on Mount Zion. And on Zion, the Gentiles participate with David. 
in the worship of Israel's God. It is on Mount Zion that David sits before the presence of God. And it is on Mount Zion that you have the book of Psalms first composed and you have a liturgical orchestra first arranged. The king comes to its throne, people take up their instruments uh, and begin to sing. That's why the Psalms always consistently refer to the mountain of God, Zion. It's a central theme of the book of Psalms because David wrote most of the Psalms. So Jesus ascends uh, as the messianic king, but also as the embodied presence of God into Jerusalem. And he goes to the temple and he goes to the temple because we were told in the prophets that the second temple will have a visible manifestation of divine glory that supersedes even the manifestation of glory in Exodus chapter 40, 1 Kings chapter 8. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus goes into the temple and in uh, the temple, he... Uh, uh, symbolically enacts its destruction. He overturns the tables in the temple. He stops the system from working for a period of time. He renders a judgment on it. And he renders a judgment on it because it has become, in his words, a den of thieves. Now, a den is essentially a place where the thieves dwell and multiply. It's not just a place that thieves are. It's a place where the a problem festers. We see this in the book of Revelation, out of the temple from which the river of life was supposed to flow. Instead, blood flows from the temple. So after Jesus does this work in uh, the temple, he sets up another table. And that table is the table of the Eucharist. You should understand these two events to be uh, uh, irrevocably and inseparably conjoined with each other. He enters into Jerusalem, the city of God, as the one who both dwells in and builds the holy temple. And he goes into that temple and evaluates it as wanting. I would recommend a book, uh, the uh, Apostolic Liturgy and the Epistle to the Hebrews, which examines the language of the Epistle to the Hebrews in light of the traditional liturgy of the Church of Jerusalem or the Liturgy of St. James. I think a lot of people, they hear the Liturgy of St. James, and we're talking about uh, uh, James uh, the, the the first head of the Jerusalem church who was in Jesus's family. Uh, and people kind of assume, well, this 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 sounds like a much later un, unreliable tradition, but its association with the Jerusalem church and with St. James is very old. And well, it undoubtedly grew over time and was shaped over time. I think this is the, like this is representative of a genuine apostolic liturgy. And I think James himself really did write a rubric for the apostolic liturgy. And it's really interesting the way in which the epistle to the Hebrews makes sense in view of that apostolic liturgy, um, and specifically the liturgy of St. James. It says, for example, in Hebrews, uh, we have an altar from which those outside have no right to eat. Uh, this is talking about the Eucharist. Um, why should we take this to mean it's been naturally interpreted in relation to the Eucharist for the whole of Christian history um, uh, what exactly leads us to dismiss its prima facie meaning. But if that's not enough, just compare 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? Paul says that to explain why we eat the Eucharist. So we eat the sacrifice and are made participants in the altar. Hebrews, those who have an alt, uh, we have an altar from which those outside have no right to eat. This is a major aspect of the New Testament case for liturgical worship. The fact that Hebrews seems to be preached in a liturgical context. It refers to things like an altar. It, uh, um, uh, it has a specific kind of theological logic to it. Um, and if you like take the, the way that um, uh, Israel moves in the book of Exodus, in our divine liturgy, our divine liturgy is a covenant renewal. We, the high, or the uh, the priest, ascends to the altar, in the little entrance, um, and this in antiquity was when he first entered into, or entered or ascended up to the altar. So now he comes out and he goes back in. Uh, in antiquity, this is when the priest actually went up to the altar for the first time. Um, in other services, you'd be standing outside. Uh, this corresponds to Israel's coming to Mount Sinai, because altars are holy mountains. That's what we're told in Ezekiel. The altar is actually called the mountain of God. Uh, an altar is supposed to be of uncut stone. 
Likewise, in Daniel 2, we're told of a stone cut without hands, which grows to be a mountain which fills the whole earth. Mountains are links between heaven and earth. The presence of God comes down through mountains, flows to the ends of the earth. Israel comes to the mountain, and then God speaks. Think about what happens in our divine liturgy. The little entrance, we go up, and then soon after that, you have the epistle and gospel reading. Okay, so this is God speaking. Okay, this is the word of God, which is being preached out to us. Then, so Exodus 20 is God speaking, but what about Exodus 21 to 23? Exodus 21 to 23 is the book of the law mediated through Moses. So after uh, we hear God's voice in uh, the gospel and epistle, we hear a sermon. The sermon is the representative uh, of God who has digested the words of God and restructures them because there's an infinite way, infinite number of ways you can restructure this because God is infinite. Uh, in uh, Revelation chapter uh, uh, 10, Revelation is also a divine liturgy. Revelation chapter 10, you have God who is acting and then John takes the book and he eats it. And then he hears seven thunders. God says, don't repeat the seven thunders. But it's John who digests the seven thunders, which are written in this book, and then tells them out. He writes an interpretation of them, which is Revelation 11 and following. Uh, there are seven, according to James Jordan, loud noises throughout this section of the book, corresponding thus to the seven thunders. So we have a sermon which has a theological context. It has a liturgical context, which goes back to Moses. Um, it's not just something which is placed where it is for no reason at all, no reason whatsoever. And I've really been struck by how well um, uh, Hebrews 12 reads as the conclusion of a sermon that is preached before the liturgy of the faithful, which is when the Eucharist is celebrated. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, Paul says. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape uh, if we reject him who warns from heaven. Ah, there we go. We have the word of God that is being proclaimed from the holy mountain. Paul is exegeting the word of God, which was proclaimed by the Holy Mountain. I think that Paul is preaching this after the gospel and epistle reading or the equivalent in this divine liturgy. I think he is essentially the guest uh, uh, celebrant at the church of Jerusalem. He's preaching this. Um, therefore, uh, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And here's the key phrase. And thus let us offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Whenever my priest um, finishes the sermon, he says, let us offer the gifts on behalf of the whole world. And it's just so striking that Paul ends his sermon. Which that's what I think it is in this way, because this is exactly the sort of thing which makes sense immediately preceding the liturgy of the faithful. Let us offer to God an acceptable worship. That's not just a generic command. Paul is like, let us do this now. Let's offer to God now this acceptable worship, liturgical worship. This is the Eucharist. This is that altar from which those outside do not have a right to eat. Now, after Hebrews, uh, 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 the sermon part, you have Hebrews chapter 13. Now, remember, what's going on in the divine liturgy is we are being gathered around the mountain of God because this is God's throne room uh, in communion with all of the saints and angels who have come before the heavenly council, the heavenly court. This is what joins us to Jesus who rules the world and thus it makes us rulers of the world with him. Uh, we read in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, uh, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Remember, Ezekiel says the Messianic temple will be a city on a mountain filled with the presence of God. City of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn. So the sons of God is a way of talking about the heavenly council. Um, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Well, made perfect in this context means you grow up. These are the saints. So Paul is talking in a liturgical context about worshiping on the holy mountain of God where we worship with the angels and the saints. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says you will judge angels in the context of the liturgy. This is the heavenly courtroom. We receive our authority to judge 
in the heavenly courtroom, and that is to say, in the liturgy. Revelation chapter 20. Remember, this all happens in the heavenly court in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20 says, uh, John says, I saw those to whom the authority to judge was committed. That is, those who sit on those thrones, which were left empty by the departure of the 24 archangelic elders. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Remember how Cain uh, is, his murder of Abel happened in a sacrificial context. So in antiquity, you build something important, you build a city. At the threshold, the entrance points of that city would offer a sacrifice. Kiel, when he rebuilds Jericho, uh, he offers a human sacrifice upon which Jericho is built. Cain, after he murders Abel, does so in a sacrificial context. He had just offered a vegetable sacrifice, which did not please God. Then he murders his brother. His blood is shed upon the ground, and the ground cries out against the blood of Abel, which had been unlawfully shed. But then Cain builds a city on the blood of his murdered uh, brother. 